Hello and welcome to this video on Charge the Light Brigade by Lord Alfred Tennyson. Before we look at this particular poem, what we're going to do is going to have a look at a bit of a background information to the events in the poem. So before the Charge of Light Brigade, which was a battle that happened at a place called Balaclava, um, which is off the Black Sea in Eastern Europe, Britain was seen as a very strong nation. We had the empire behind us, um, and the last war that Britain had been in was the Battle of Waterloo, the Napoleonic Wars, in which we were very, very successful and won. And so Britain was seen on a being a, a very, very strong force in the whole of the world. And this one particular event kind of nudged that, because what happened, um, the Invading uh, Russians, Britain was against Russian. It was called the Crimean War that we're part of. And we know some figures from the Crimean War because we know of um, Florence Nightingale. Um, she was one of the nurses that helped out with the Crimean War. And in this particular case, what happened is that the Light Brigade, now Light Brigade tended to mean that they had swords and small guns, but they didn't have anything bigger like cannons and heavy machinery and so often the light brigade would go in to do quick little attacks rather than attacking big armies and so what we had is we had a valley and in the valley we had several um, leaders in charge one of them was called Lucan the other one was called Cardigan and the other one was called um, Raglan and so these guys were in charge of um, different groups of soldiers and along the case a message was misunderstood and Cardigan took a group of soldiers into a valley that was surrounded on all sides by heavy artillery so cannons and soldiers so basically these soldiers went in and they were surrounded and they were defeated. And so a lot of soldiers died at this one particular moment in time as a result of poor communication and the flat fact that Cardigan couldn't see um, the soldiers, the Russian soldiers um, in this valley because the way that the valley was shaped and the way that things were. So this is quite an infamous event in history for for Britain because it was a defeat, you know, a very embarrassing defeat in terms of what actually happened. But the way that this was presented, and often it's referred to, and the poem is called The Charge of Light Brigade, but you can kind of see that this is the way that it was actually presented. And it was presented as being something noble, these soldiers drove into battle, um, they died, but you know, they were strong. If you have a look at this painting here, you can see the horses scared um, straight ahead of us, but also the soldiers are looking head on face. So the soldiers are quite brave and patriotic and they're doing this and they've gone straight into battle, which was a defeat. But the thing about this particular conflict with the Crimean War was it was the first war to be really reported by newspapers and there were reporters who were sending by telegram um, actual descriptions of the events that were happening. Now prior to that what's happened with wars is that the people at home when they read things in the newspapers it's probably information that's been passed down over a couple of weeks what we were getting at the time of the Crimean War is exactly what we have now, is that if there is something going on, we could probably have live footage straight away from somebody's mobile phone. So this was the closest that we were getting to kind of modern reporting of the news, of things that were happening. So we had reporters there at the time. So with this defeat, it was reported back. And so this is what William Howard Russell said at the Times. So he said, they swept, swept proudly past, glittering in the morning sun in all their pride and splendour of war. We could hardly believe the evidence of our senses. Surely that handful of men were not going to charge an army in position. 
and at the distance of 1,200 yards, the whole line of the enemy belched forth from 30 iron mouths a flood of smoke and flame through which hissed the deadly balls. Their flight was marked by instant gaps in our ranks. The dead men and horses, by steeds, flying wounded or riderless across the plain. So if you have a look, that was how it was reported in the time. So these great soldiers glittering in the sun, full of pride, and how they were slaughtered. And it was awful when you think about it. And actually, the way they describe it, and this is where I think, you know, if you've got soldiers and at this point, armour wasn't really introduced until the World Wars. And so these soldiers were wearing cloth. And that's what they had against bullets, against swords, and also cannons. Because in this valley, we had cannons, Russian cannons, firing off cannonballs. And so these men didn't stand a chance with their swords and little guns that they've got. And so really, they were outnumbered. So this was what was reported, and was reported to the British Public. Now it's interesting the attitude towards how war is presented is quite interesting because it changes. So if we have a look at how other people have presented it, and Elizabeth Thompson after this painted um, this depiction, which actually gives us a bit of a realistic viewpoint of what war was like compared to that other painting. The other painting was very, the soldiers were brave and strong, but this shows us the consequences of what war is really like, that we've got people dead, injured, suffering, in agony. They're no longer these strong, powerful figures. And so what we have is very much an interesting idea, kind of a conflict of ideas. You know, that a soldier going into battle, are they incredibly brave or is it somehow quite foolish and sad and, and, and upsetting? And so we have a conflict of how do you present heroes and how do you present soldiers in war? Now, one of the things that kind of stayed with Tennyson afterwards was another line from one of the Times reports was this. The British soldier will do his duty, even to certain death, and is not paralysed by the feeling that he is the victim of some hideous blunder. And I think it's a really, really interesting thing, because this is about talking about the soldiers and what the soldiers did and how they knew they were going to die, but it's not up to them to make the decisions and run away because this was a blunder. It was a very, very big mistake that cost people's lives. But the fact is, and this is the angle that Tennyson is taking, he's saying, well, these soldiers are so great because somebody made a mistake that they didn't question. And that is true patriotism. That is what it is to be a soldier, that they didn't question what was going on that they just went in. Now, the way that the actual events happened of the Charge of the Light Brigade, it actually was presented as being something brave and noble. And so the soldiers were presented as being this fantastic. And this was really a bit of spin that was put on this because it was presented that how these soldiers were brave and Cardigan, who was one of the people responsible for the miscommunication, came back a hero. And then after, years after, people sort of, and information started coming back, and people sort of realised that actually Cardigan and other leaders at that time, um, they were responsible for what happened, and they didn't behave in a very heroic and noble way. And in fact, Cardigan kind of ran away um, during this event, while the other soldiers battled on and fought. So it puts us in a really, really interesting situation that we've got here because Tennyson was the poet laureate and the poet laureate is there to represent um, the country. 
and so Tennyson was acting as a voice of the country and that's something to remember when we read through the poem. Now before we actually look at the poem we're going to do our ideas so what are the big ideas behind the poem so hopefully I've given you a bit of ammunition and something to talk about and think about with this so we're going to pause the video in a second for you to jot down your ideas okay so why should soldiers fight for their country how should a country honor a fallen soldier and what makes a good soldier so just pause the video and just jot down your ideas in relation to those big ideas that this poem is going to look at so as soon as the pause video symbol has disappeared then you can carry on working through the video Okay, let's go through some ideas and see what you've come up with. No, no, we haven't talked about the poem just yet, but we're going to be able to attach some of these ideas to the poem and see if they relate to what we think about these things. So why should soldiers fight for their country? Well, it's about protection, isn't it? That's why soldiers uh, fight. They're there to protect or they're there to uphold the values of, of what we represent. So, for example, if it's about democracy, they are fighting for democracy or justice so they are there to protect the country but also to fight for freedom of those sorts of things now, the question is how should a country honor fallen soldiers well we know from a modern perspective is that we remember them that's how we remember soldiers that have fallen and so we have remembrance day don't we to deal with those sorts of things so that's how we should honor them so we should show them respect. We shouldn't forget them. We shouldn't forget what they've done for us. And here's an interesting one. What makes a good soldier? Well, if we have a look at what we're looking about Tennyson and this idea of soldiers following orders, that's what makes a good soldier. A good soldier is a soldier who is willing to die and doesn't question, but does it for their faith for their country and so those are some ideas that hopefully you'll be able to link into the poem when we look at the poem so here's the poem charge of light brigade by lord alfred tennyson half a league half a league half a league onward all in the valley of death rode the 600 forward the light brigade charge for the guns he said into the valley of death rode the 600 Forward, the light brigade, was there a man dismayed, not though the soldier knew, someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death, read the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600 flashed all their sabres bare flashed as they turned in air sabring the gunners there charging an army while all the world wondered plunged in the battery smoke right through the line they broke cossack and russian reeled from the saber stroke shattered and sundered then they rode back but not not the 600 cannon to the left right of them cannon to the left of them cannon behind them volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell all that was left of them left of 600 when can their glory fade oh the wild charge they made all the world wondered honor the charge they made honor the light brigade noble six okay let's go back to our ideas then so what is this poem saying about why soldiers should fight for their country what is this poem saying that people should do about those soldiers and what here makes a good soldier so pause the video and think about what ideas you now have about these in relation to the poem that we've just read.
OK, let's go through our answers then. So why should soldiers fight for their country according to this? Well, it's because you're going to become remembered and you're going to be known as this noble number, this noble figure. So in a way, you become sort of like a god in this poem. You become something that's going to be remembered. And, and think about this poem. 1854, this poem we're reading now in 2020 or 2021, depending on when you're watching this video. But that shows you how soldiers become immortalised. You know, and no matter how old you are, these soldiers have become immortal and they're remembered long after the event. So, you know, they're even though they didn't win, they are remembered for what they did. And, and that is kind of that sense of sort of, you know, you've transformed from being an ordinary person to being something um, extraordinary. How should a country honour fallen soldiers? Well, the whole poem is about remembering it and showing honour. And it uses that word honour several times. Honour there. So it is about showing honour and respecting what they did, which could be linked to remembering, but also could be acknowledging what they've done as well. Another interesting thing in the poem is what makes a good soldier? Well, these soldiers are brilliant soldiers because they didn't question they didn't question and they did what they were told to do even when the situation looks absolutely awful with cannons all around them they went into it and they knew in a way they were going to die and that's what makes a good soldier they knew that they were sacrificing their lives to make um, the world a better place and that's what makes a good soldier according to the poem. Now there may be other ideas in there and obviously remember poems are quite complex and there's lots of ideas and sometimes they bubble up to the surface and sometimes they link to other things. The whole thing about these clusters of poems is to think right look at this poem and think about well does this poem link into one of the others? Does it have different ideas that other poems don't have? So it's all about looking at connecting ideas and building out ideas all together. Now, before we start looking at the poem in terms of how is it written, we're going to look at the poem from another angle because Lord Alfred Tennyson was viewed as being one of the greatest Victorian poets. And there's something about his writing that I want to draw attention to, because this is another poem. You don't need to know this poem, but I just thought I'd give you another poem to kind of see, see any similarities that you can spot with the way that he writes, because there is a particular style in the way that he writes, and you'll hopefully be able to see it when I read through the poem. So here we go, The Wall. There is a sound of thunder afar, Storm in the south that darkens the day, storm of battle and thunder of war. Well, if it do not roll our way, form, form, riflemen, form, ready, be ready to meet the storm. Riflemen, 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 form. Be not deaf to the sound that warns, be not gulled by a despot's plea, of figs of thistles or grapes of thorns. How should a despot set men free? Form, form, riflemen, form, ready, be ready to meet the storm. Riflemen, 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 four. Let your reforms for a moment go. Look to your butts and make good aims. Better a rotten borough or so than a rotten fleet or a city of flames. Form, form, riflemen, four. Ready, be ready to meet the storm. Riflemen, 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 four. Form, be ready to do or die. Form, in freedom's name and the Queen's. True that we have a faithful ally. But only the devil knows what he means. Form, form, riflemen, form. Ready, be ready to meet the storm. Riflemen, 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 form. Now, hopefully you can see some patterns. And if you have a look, there's lots of repetition in the poem. That's one of the things that Tennyson does quite a lot. But also he plays with sounds. He has repetition and he has little phrases that are repeated again and again and a bit like a chorus because we've got that ready be ready to meet the storm riflemen 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 four and know what happens that happens at the end of each stanza and 
we've even got a bit of a line that's kind of repeated again. To do or die is a line that we've got within Charge Light Brigade. So the reason I'm showing you that is so you can see that actually there is a style and that Tennyson has a particular style of poetry. And so I want you to be mindful of that. So when we look at the poem, we can kind of say, oh, this is kind of typical of the way that Tennyson writes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at one particular thing in great detail in the poem, and that is repetition. And we're going to look at some examples of the way that Tennyson used repetition in the poem. Now, one of the reasons is for using repetition is he wants us to remember. That's why repetition is used. It's there to make us remember things. But also there are other effects. And we're going to look at the effects of the different bits of repetition and actually how they link into the meaning of the poem and what's actually going on in the poem. So if we look at the first bit, half a league, half a league, half a league onward. So we can see we're at the beginning of the poem, we've got this repetition. OK, and this idea of half a league, a league is a distance. And so it's talking about this. Now, one of the things that people tend to say is this little repetition at the start of the poem gives the sense of the horses. So half a league, half a league, half a league, that kind of sense of the horse's beat as it's galloping on, it's onward. And you can see that we've got a triplet. So we've got a repetition and it's in threes. And that's a common thing that we see in writing where we've got a triplet and we've got that repetition, that building up on there. And you can see that we kind of got that repetition, but then we've also got onward. That kind of like breaks the rhythm of the pattern there that we've got there. So here, We've got repetition to reflect the movement of these soldiers. And we've got of the horses, hooves meeting the ground. So it's got that sense of kind of making it sound like it were actually there in a way. We've got another bit of repetition here. And we've got that there's not to make and reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. And notice that repetition from another poet to do and die and that repetition of the sound effect okay so the sound the, the sound is repeated the d sound now what's interesting is that this is about grouping the soldiers together and notice that look they didn't question it once they didn't question it twice they didn't question so it gives us the idea that maybe there was a lot of things they could have questioned, but they didn't question it. They didn't answer back. They didn't question. They just did it. And it gives that sense that these soldiers were so loyal. And it repeats that repetition is there to highlight how loyal these soldiers were. But also the repetition of there gives the sense of how these soldiers were a unit and that identity of a group together. So we've got a different way of using repetition. So repetition to show how loyal these soldiers were. Now, more repetition, but repetition used in a different way. Now, note at this point, we haven't said repetition to stand out or to make it interesting. All right. That's rubbish kind of explanation. We're looking at how does it link into meaning? So if we have a look here. Cannons to the right of them, cannons to the left of them, cannons in front. So we've got the idea that these soldiers had got cannons firing all sides apart from behind. So you can see that this gives that sense, that repetition shows us how trapped they were and how actually it was a lost cause before even getting into there. So they were firing in one way, another way, and in front of them. So how are they going to escape? How could they possibly escape? So it gives us that sense of this is how trapped they were, but also how weak they are. And if we think about David and Goliath, there's our Goliath. You know, they are being attacked by something bigger and stronger and more powerful in this situation. And then we've got little bits here. So 
into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell. And if we have a look at that repetition that we've got there, that kind of sense of them getting further and further into the, da the dangerous situation. So they're getting worse and worse. So the repetition helps us understand how far these people are in this dangerous situation. So they're here, but they go further and further. Remember what we said before in the previous bit of repetition, you know, that they could have turned around. They could have turned around at any point. You know, if I saw cannons in front of me, to the left of me and to the right of me, I'd probably turn around. But they didn't. And they went into the jaws of death. But at that point, you might go, well, I think I'm going to chicken out and go. But they didn't. They rode into the mouth of hell. So that repetition shows us how are these people are going into this dangerous situation but also highlights how they weren't they could have turned back and they could have turned around and but they didn't they kept going because they were loyal they were faithful and then look what the poet does because then we have a stanza later on that actually repeats that structure so we have, again, the cannon to the right of them, cannons to the left of them, and cannon behind them. So look what happens. So we're seeing it from a different angle now. Now, the repetition, so we've got even more repetition of cannon, cannon, cannon. But the repetition, has the, have the cannon stopped? No. So they haven't even dinted this powerful. So we're seeing the power of this the russian forces and look what happens in front behind them so they're now leaving so they're moving away and we can see how there's repetition of lots of phrases volleyed and thundered so it's still noisy it's still being attacked nothing's changed stormed out with shot and shell while horse and hero fell well look there's the difference now they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of the 600. So we've got that repetition of jaws of death and the mouth of hell, but actually we've changed the word associated, the position of where they are. So the first one was into, and this now, is turning they've come through it and they've returned back from it so you can see how that repetition is used for effect there so the cannons it shows us how bad this situation it shows us how the soldiers never turned back and then finally it shows us how you know there's still nothing has changed even though they've gone in to fight the battle nothing's happened the enemy hasn't changed and hasn't been reduced. In fact, you know, it's they're still strong. But what happens is they've been defeated. Now, repetition happens in another part of the poem, because at the end of each stanza, we have a line that links into the 600. Now, remember what we said, that this poem is about remembering those that have died and in a way, it's kind of glorifying them and turning them into something quite immortal um, so that we remember them forever. And that is used in the structure of the poem and the way that this repetition is used, because the first three stanzas all talk about how the soldiers rode. And note how it's not whimpered and it's not kind of stumbled, but it's kind of that quite patriotic road that they're quite determined. Again, that's 600. So we don't forget and we never forget that 600 people went into battle. And that's really important thing. That's what the poet wants us to remember, that 600 people went into battle. A bit, at least about 150 of those soldiers uh, died and 120 were injured as a result of this um, blunder that went on. 
by line stanza four, when they're actually in the battle, we're learning that not the 600, something's changed. And we see that change in the poem because in line stanza five, we get left of the 600. Now notice it doesn't say how many people died. It's still about the 600. So everybody in a way is equally important. It's that 600. This whole um, brigade is really, really important. They're equally important. The people that died, the people that survived, it's about how brave these soldiers were to go into battle and not to question what happened to them. And at the end, the last stanza and the last line, we have noble 600. So again, we have that little bit of a dip in the middle of the poem where it kind of we know that people have died and then they are now suddenly turned into noble. They are somebody to remember. They are somebody to be praised. They are fantastic. And note that we've got a change in the line because we have an exclamation mark and in almost the way that the poet is shouting. You know, this is what we should remember. And remember that Tennyson was the poet laureate and he was writing to represent what the country was thinking. And that's what they would be thinking. They'd be patriotic about these soldiers. These soldiers died. And in the first instance of this event that was reported back, it was about patriotism. It was about these soldiers. My goodness, they have done been in a terrible situation. But how brave they were to keep fighting. How brave. That is true determination. That is truly a you know British soldier in the Crimean War. They fight to the bitter end. And this is what he's trying to get us to remember. That this, this is what the soldier is about. It's not about the death, but it's about what these soldiers did for their country. And that's why in the poem, it doesn't mention the death so much. In a way, it kind of hides and skirts around the people that died. It's about the what the soldiers did and the fact that they didn't question what happened. And we look at some images in the poem. And remember, when you're thinking about what to write about the poem, it's quite easy to pick out an image and talk about it. Remember, turn it into a symbol. What can you say about that image? So I'm going to give you three. So we've got the valley. We've got the sabres, the swords, and we've got the cannons. So there are three images that we've got there. So just pause the video and think, what is the poet showing us with this message and this idea with these symbols here? So pause the video and after the pause symbols disappeared, we'll talk about what they could possibly mean. OK, so let's have a look at the these symbols that we've got there. So the first thing is, is the cannon. OK, I'm going to look at the cannon. And, and really, interestingly, it's about strength and power, isn't it? And it's this idea of how the Russian army in the Crimean War, the strength and the might and the power, OK, that they've got. Now, what's quite interesting is the juxtaposition. Now, juxtaposition is when you place two things near each other and it helps us understand something a little bit more. So if we look at the cannon being the strength and the power, and we know that in the time that the Russian forces were a strength, a very powerful thing. Um, and if we look at by placing that next to each other, and particularly the light brigade, and there was the heavy brigade, they would be dealing with the more heavy artillery, you know, the cannons and that, but the light brigade had swords. So if you see that what we've got is this kind of contrast in terms of power, that we've got the Russians with their strength and lots of power, hence cannons to the left of me, cannons to the right of them. OK, and we've got the British soldiers um, with their idea, just their swords. So a sword against the cannon. Um, and if you don't know what cannons do, aside from shooting out cannonballs, cannonballs are usually, you know, they're put in a tube, an explosion happens and it superheats and charges this ball of metal which can go through people and blow people up. And so that's what they had to protect themselves against those sorts of things. So they were defeated already before they'd started, if you think about doing it. So it shows us, in a way, how sad the situation was for these soldiers, because we know that you cannot fight cannons with a sword. We know that. 
And so it highlights how weak these soldiers were in comparison, how they were defeated already. But I also think that the use of the sabre shows us the strength and the courage of the British soldier, that these soldiers, even though the odds were against them, they were willing to fight and they were going to carry on fighting and they were determined to fight regardless of the situation and what would happen to their own lives. So I think, yes, we've kind of got a David and Goliath kind of situation here, but we've got the brave, strong um, soldier against the powerful might. And what we're kind of seeing here is this idea of, that we tend to like in society of the underdog, you know, the weak person defeating the powerful enemy. And that's what we've kind of got in here, that kind of way in which a bit of spin, if you want to think about how this terrible situation was turned around by looking, instead of focusing on how terrible the situation was, it's how brave these soldiers were in an awful situation. So in a way, it's kind of changing things around and not blaming anybody, but saying how strong. And so the focus is away from people in particular. Now, the last image is about the valley. And I do think that plays into that idea of how this idea about size and about strength and how you've got somebody little and you've got something big surrounding it. And I think the valley image does play into this whole idea about the big, powerful Russian army and the tiny, small uh, British light, light brigade. And so you can see how those images link into those ideas that we've got in the poem. And I'd say that they are key and important for us to remember these soldiers because these soldiers didn't have power behind them but they will be remembered because of the way that they behaved the way that they acted they didn't have powerful weapons but they fought and they were willing to sacrifice their lives okay now remember we've got lots of things we can talk about poem and you know and if we wanted to, we could talk about each line in the poem, and we're not going to do that because what we want to do is go away and explore the poem and see what else you can find. So what I've done is picked out four little bits in the poem, and what we're going to do is just pause the video and just think, what could you say about these little bits and how they link into the ideas and how do they kind of link into the effect? So what is the poet supposed to try to make the reader feel at this point? Are they supposed to feel a good feeling? Or a bad feeling. So just pause the video and we'll carry on when the pause symbols disappears. Okay, let's go through this then. So all the world wandered. So obviously we've got a bit of alliteration here. Okay, now remember with alliteration there's very little you can say about alliteration. So avoid it where possible. However, what we've got here is a bit of a metaphor, the world wandered. And I would say that this bit here, and it's mentioned twice, and it's almost like it's the shock, the world wandered. It doesn't physically mean the world, it means people at home, isn't it? Reading the newspapers. And we know that um, Tennyson, the way that he experienced this war, he wasn't in the war. He was reading newspaper reports and as it was coming in, he was reading it. So in a way, that's a bit like the audience um, at home. They're wondering what happens. And this whole idea that it's repeated, you know, in the battle, they went to fight in the battle and they wondered. And then right at the end, all the war world wandered again at the last bit. It's that kind of relationship between the people at home and the people at um, in the battle itself. And so I think really what Tennyson is kind of doing is kind of pointing out the helplessness that we are about things, that we are reliant on the soldiers to protect us. And we're wondering and we kind of care about these soldiers of what happened. Another thing then, so we've got a number of metaphors and images to do 
with the battle itself. So we've got the jaws of death. We've got the mouth of hell. And we've got this idea that it's hell, that these soldiers are going into hell. Now, we do know that Tennyson's father was um, was in the church. And so we can see that. And we know the Victorian age was very religious. So we're seeing that these soldiers are going to hell and they're going to the worst place in in the world. And we're seeing that religious imagery and it's personified. It's seen as being a, a person, you know, the mouth of hell, the jaws of death. They're going in there and some of them are going to return victorious. And it's highlighting the danger that we've got in there. But we do have other biblical images in there because we've got the valley of death. Um, and that's referred to in the first stanza. And the valley of death relates to the Bible and a psalm into the valley of death. And it's relating to about this idea of dying and the biblical imagery associated with dying and the battle of life. And this is what we've got here. Then we've got another image here at the end of the poem when it says, when can their glory fade? And that word fade is a really, really interesting word, because what does fade mean? It means to disappear very, very slowly and suddenly so that you don't even notice what's happening. And you notice that with, you know, when the light fades things, it doesn't change suddenly. And I think that word is a really, really important word that Tennyson uses in the poem because he's highlighting why these soldiers should be glorified treated with glory that they should be praised and put on a pedestal and, and and shown to be fantastic but the word fade is quite a telling word because he's saying when should we start forgetting about it and he's kind of really making that point about our respect for those people that die in battle and in a way he's saying but, you know, we've got to be careful here because people could forget. Remember what I said, this whole poem is about remembering what these soldiers did. And so here he's drawing attention to it. It's kind of saying, well, don't forget. You know, these soldiers shouldn't be forgotten. And that word fade is really important because it's about that memory. And memories don't just suddenly you forget things. They disappear. They're, they're not as strong as they weaken. And so he's saying, in effect, that possibly... What could happen to these soldiers is they could be forgotten, you know, and another war happens and another battle and then more soldiers die. And that one gets weaker and we forget about those. And I think this is Tennyson reading and measuring what the public were thinking and feeling at the time. And that was, you know, that these are fantastic soldiers. They did a fantastic thing in a terrible situation. and yet we'll probably forget it. And so really on this idea of patriotism, Tennyson is saying, you mustn't forget. And in fact, if we look at the last thing, honor the charge they made, and he uses an exclamation mark. And what we've got there is an imperative verb. Uh, that's a command when we put a verb at the start of a sentence or a phrase. Honour the charge they made. So in a way, the last stanza is Tennyson talking directly to us and saying, don't forget and saying you've got to remember and you've got to remember about what's happened. OK, so we're going to look at the form of the poem. Now, the poem is a narrative poem. It, it's telling us a story. It's, it's third person perspective. Um, I'm going to look at how the poem uses rhyme. So remember what we said when we looked at that other Tennyson poem. Tennyson is very much a poet that's like about the sounds of things and about the rhythm of things and about patterns. And that's reflected, too, in the way that the poem uses rhyme. So just want you to just quickly pause the video and just think what do you notice about the way that the poet has used rhyme, in particular these two different stanzas. OK, now 
Remember what we said about before about poetry and about rhyming and unrhyming poetry. Well, when we said that rhyming, um, it's kind of unnatural, it's planned, and it could be quite lyrical, nice to listen to. In here, this is very much planned. I would say. And I think that reflects the organisation of an army because armies have to follow orders and they have to march and they work in a particular order, don't they? So I think the writers using rhyme here to reflect the brigade and how dutiful they are and the fact that we've got that rhyming in there. I'd also say that it's interesting to look at when the poem breaks the rhyme. And it isn't in a straightforward rhyme, um, because if we have a look here, we've got repetition rather than rhyming here. We've got AAA, and then we've got B that matches with the last line here, thundered 600. So that's quite a bit of time before we get that particular kind of rhyme again. So it doesn't happen in a clear, straightforward manner. But what also also say is this thundered, and this 600, and then we've got that again in wondered and also sundered and hundred in this hymn. And we've got through the whole poem, we've got a thread of this rhyme that matches with thundered, hundred, wondered, sundered, and hundred again. So, and that I would say links into blundered because in this poem, there was a blunder, there was a mistake. And so we're kind of linking all these ideas together through the rhyme. And we can see that connection between everything that happens to these soldiers, the violence and the world wandering is linked also to this blunder. And there's a connection. And we can see that throughout the poem through that rhyme. So it's an interesting thing there. But then we look at the rest of the rhyme and we can see shall, well, hell. But then in this first one, death. So there's a word there that doesn't rhyme with anything else in that whole stanza. So whereas we could say that there's that the soldiers, that rhyming pattern could be the, the way that the army is so determined and organised and how they work together. But we could also say that this break in the rhyme could also reflect that damage that's happening to the soldiers because they're entering this damaging situation and so we're seeing the break in the rhyme and so for the most of the time the soldiers are doing what they're supposed to be doing until they're being shot at if we carry on with the next bit so we've got air bear and there so we've kind of got that same pattern there not quite repetition but we've got it there and then we've got while that doesn't match up so we've got one of those odd rhymes that doesn't quite fit in along with death. Wondered we've seen before, then we've got smoke, broke, and then we've got Russian, and then not. And so we're seeing there's a lot more breaks in the rhyme scheme and the pattern here. Now, why should there be more rhymes in this stanza than this stanza? What's happening here? What's the big thing that's happening here? Well, it's the chaos, isn't it? It's the battle. So what's going to happen is we're seeing the breakup of the brigade. They're no longer this organised unit of people and there's chaos. And the rhyme scheme, I would say, reflects that there. The fact that we've got it starts off rhyming, but then the rhyme breaks. And I'd say that that is reflecting the conflict and the violence because you know the battle is not going to be a very neat and tidy thing it's going to be chaotic so you can see how the rhyme reflects what's going on in the poem now we're going to look at the structure of the poem and structure is one of those things that people forget and it's an easy thing to talk about and easy thing to compare to with other poems and so when we look at the poem and we look at it in detail we can see that there's kind of a bit of a straightforward and in a way, this poem is about a journey, a journey. And when you look at poetry, see if the poem that you're reading and comparing is a journey. Well, this is a thing. The order is given in the first stanza. Nobody questions it. And I would say these two bits 
are really, really important because that's the build up to what happens. And the fact the order is given and no big questions, because I think that's what raises these soldiers up from being just ordinary soldiers to being these fantastic noble 600 because they don't question. And look what happens. Now, most of us, when we're thinking about a battle and fight, you get to the battle straight away. They don't. They give us that background information because that's important to understand how brave these soldiers were. Then we have them moving towards the attack. And then we have the attack. And it's not as descriptive as we like to think it could have been. OK, and actually only one stanza is about the attack. The rest is around that. The retreat and then finally remember the soldiers. So in effect, what Tennyson is doing is structured the whole poem about the attack, but it isn't all about the attack. It is about what happened before and what happens afterwards. And in a way, we could say that this poem is the soldier's journey to being saints and being canonised by the actual British public of the time. And notice that Tennyson doesn't describe the battle in too much detail. He doesn't mention the deaths in too much detail because he doesn't want it, the soldiers to be remembered for how they died. He wants them to be remembered for how brave they were in this situation and the fact that they didn't question. That's what should be remembered and not their death. And in a way, he kind of takes the camera and moves it away from the, the blood and the gore. And what we're focusing on, this is a terrible situation. They didn't question it, but they went and did it. And some of them escaped and some of them didn't. This is what we should remember them for not for their dying. And I think that's a really, really interesting point about the poem. So let's pull everything together. So we've got some ideas about what the poem is about. We can say some things about how it's written. And we need to think about what is the poet teaching us? And that's the big step up, all right? Yes, you can talk about some of the techniques, but we need to step it up. We need to be saying, this is the idea he's talking about, and this is why he's doing it. So in the poem, Tennyson is teaching us about the power of memory. And if we look at the poem, it's a very visual poem. It's all about visual images. And you could probably write down a few images now from the poem without even looking at it again, because we can remember it. It's very, very powerful. And he's talking about memory. And that's why he uses repetition, because he's trying to make us remember. And he's really, really working hard so we don't forget. He's also looking at the human consequences of war. He's looking about the people. Now, he could have described the soldiers dying, but he doesn't. He's talking about how these are humans who did their duty. And then he's talking about that and what happens to those. They died as a result of following orders, which is what we want soldiers to do. And we don't want them to question because what would happen on the battlefield if everybody questioned what they were doing? An interesting point is Tennyson is also criticising. Um, now, this is a tricky one because Tennyson was representing the country. And so in this situation, he has to be really, really careful because he cannot criticise the country and he cannot criticise the government and the way that he does, the way that the country does things. We do know that Tennyson was... Um, liked a lot by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So they held him in high esteem. So he had to be really careful about what he did. Now, at the time when Tennyson was writing this poem, people wouldn't have thought that he was being critical of what was happening in the conflict. What happened afterwards is people started questioning what was happening within wars and conflicts. And so people added their ideas to the poem. Now, Tennyson, we can't say, was questioning about the way that class divide was working in society. But we can say afterwards, you know, that there was a change in how the public viewed wars. 
And so, you know, there may be clues here, but we can't say. Tennyson was very uh, patriotic and was pro-Britain. And in this case, he would have been pro-war because it was there to defend uh, the empire. One of the things that came out of the war, and particularly the Crimean War, was that people could pay to become um, leaders in battles. So, for example, Lord Cardigan, um, one of the people in charge of the Light Brigade, he paid money to be in his position. And so lots of people with money did that. And so the rich tended to be um, officers, colonel, um, majors. And so, but they paid for the duty to do it. Whereas the people who didn't have money, they were soldiers. And so we could say, after this poem was released, that we can see elements in there. But Tennyson wasn't challenging that. But we can say, as modern readers, we can see that class divide. And the idea about that blundered. And I think Tennyson is being really, really careful about what he's saying about things. He isn't blaming anybody in the poem. He uses the word blunder, and that suggests that it's a mistake, but he doesn't say who made that mistake. And what he's actually doing is he's raising the status of the soldiers so that we don't ask the question about the mistake, and it becomes about the soldiers. And in a way, I think Tennyson could be hiding the people who blundered, who made the mistake. And that's quite a subtle thing. But because he is pro-Britain and he is also pro-war because Britain was in war at that time and he was in a very, very difficult situation. We don't know what his uh, political uh, ideas were in relation to this poem, but we can assume that he would be very patriotic. And so this little thing that he's got here, we can't say that he's attacking. But what we can say is what he does do is he hides the people who are to blame for what happened. And he hides the blame in the poem. And he actually puts the attention on the soldiers. So he is celebrating patriotism. He is exploring how war is presented. And he's showing us the war. And he's not doing a kind of warts and all kind of view. He's showing us, in a way, a romanticised view of war. He's showing us as war as being something good and noble, that you become somebody different if you fight in a war. He's kind of hiding the reality of war. He's not showing us. He shows us that people die, but we don't really see them dying. And so in a way, we could say that Tennyson glosses over the reality of war. He kind of romanticises war in war that transforms soldiers into being something godlike. Now remember, when we're looking at these ideas about what it's teaching us, we need to think about where else do we see this in the poem. We need to think about why does the poet have this particular stance. Now remember, Tennyson's position, he was liked by the Queen. So he had a very, very good position. And he'd have to be careful what he did because he wouldn't want to disrupt that or cause problems because he was in favour of the Queen. And so, you know, he had to be very, very careful what he talked about. And what is the poet aiming to do? Well, he's aiming to kind of galvanise the British public into supporting these soldiers that died. OK, connections to the poem. So other poems. That we could have. So we've got a poem here about memory. This is about memory. But we've also seen in the poem Remains. And then this idea about how people remember things. And we've got in Remains a soldier that wants to forget something. And in this poem, we've got somebody who isn't a soldier that wants to remember soldiers. So we're kind of seeing an opposite. In this poem, it's about imagery. It's all about images. There's lots of images in this poem. And it's kind of remembering about how memory works on very powerful, specific images. We've got the power of truth here, you know, the questioning of what is real and what's not real. Here we've got the first bit of news, um, presentation of the war. And so here we've got somebody that in a way we could view as Tennyson glorifying a, a defeat. And he's making it 
and spinning it into something positive. In the poem, it's a conflict between the soldiers and civilians. So the civilians at home are wondering and the soldiers are fighting. So we've got that conflict with there. And we can kind of see that in war photography, because in war photography, we have the people at home who are drinking beers, um, you know, and re having baths, and the people in the, in the battlefield who are dying. And so we're seeing that conflict there. The same, the conflict between home and battlefield, which is the same conflict we see in exposure, because, you know, when the soldiers go back home, they're not quite the same, and, and people don't quite accept them. And what we've got is that relationship between the two. What should people at home do with the soldiers when they return? Here, the poet is saying they should be treated like gods and remembered. They are noble. They are fantastic. Remember them. And we've got here also in the poem the conflict between duty and cowardice. So this idea is following instructions or being a wimp and running away. In this poem, they follow their duty. And other poems you're going to see look at that debate about you know what should a soldier do should they follow their own instincts or should they follow their orders okay nearly there at the end so some quick questions then okay in terms of the poem so what i'd like you to do is pause the video and just answer these questions and then we'll answer them as soon as the pause symbol disappears OK, number one, how many soldiers people were in the light brigade? 600. Number two, what did the soldiers ride on in battle? Horses. Number three, what V is where the battle took place? The valley. Four, what C did enemies have that the light brigade didn't? Cannons. Number five, what H is the way the writer describes the place where the battle took place? Hell. Six. What do the soldiers have instead of guns? Sabres, which is a curved sword, or swords. You could have five of those. Seven, what is repeated at the end of every stanza? And that's 600, the number. What body part is used in metaphor to describe the place? So we've got mouth and jaw, so it's physical body parts. Number nine, give an example of repetition in the poem. We've got hundreds of those. Half a league, half a league, theirs not to make and reply, theirs to reason why. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, with loads of them. Okay. Now, remember there are other videos there. We will keep making these videos as we go along. If you are not sure about a poem, watch another video and watch the video again. So you make sure you know these poems very, very well. You will need to know these poems because in the GCSE exam, you may have to write about one of them from memory. And so you need to remember some bits about the poem and what they're about and what the poet is saying.